It's training day. Train to Rain with Pastor Greg V. Hurd. Good evening and happy Mother's Day from LC Live. This is Pastor Greg Hurd, and I am excited to be with you this evening on this Mother's Day celebration. Now, what I'm about to share with you has probably nothing to do with Mother's Day, but instead, instead, we're going to celebrate the good Word of God and what God is saying in this time and in this season. So I want to first off thank everyone uh, for coming the last two weekends, and uh, we've had good crowds of people very excited about what God is doing. Uh, we've been abiding by all of the rules, but... Uh, Excited to see things get back to uh, their routine, uh, not the same stuck routine, but in a new routine as far as coming together and being together and loving on one another. I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to that just greatly in my heart. So I just uh, I'm just blessed, 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 blessed with this Mother's Day. I was blessed with a good mom. I was blessed with wonderful women in my life. And of course, I've been blessed with my wife for 35 years. And I'm so grateful to have her in my life. So I salute all the mothers out there and for all that you do. And we're grateful for you. And we pray for you. Amen. So I've been talking about on Sunday nights, reigning within the system of the beast, or reigning within the system of the beast. So we're going to get right into it and uh, look at John, the 16th chapter, and verse number 33, which is our key text for these lessons. <clears throat> John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart I have overcome the world. Amen? And so here we see one of the great revelations of being a Christian is that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And in order to function, we function in two realms. We function in a physical realm, and we function in a spiritual dimension known as in Christ. In Christ, all are made alive. In Christ, there are infinite possibilities to us. In the world, we're going to face tribulation. We're going to face pressure. We're going to face opposition. We're going to face persecution. But in Christ, we can operate in peace, love, joy, and all of the wonderful fruits of the, and gifts of the Spirit. So we need to understand that we live in any given day. When you get up on Monday morning, you are actually operating in two realms. You're operating in a physical realm or natural realm, and you're operating in a spiritual realm. And uh, that spiritual realm has been a place of victory for you because the spiritual realm for the believer is in Christ. And when I am in Christ, praise God, I'm an overcomer like He is an overcomer. Amen? So we're going to face pressure. There's no scripture in the Bible that says that you will not face opposition or pressure but you will not face test and trial and tribulation. That's just a part of this life. But he says, be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. And we shared with you that that is in the present or in the perfect tense in the Greek, and it means I have overcome, I am overcoming, and I will overcome. So the overcoming power of Christ is ever present in any situation, in every circumstance. There's not a time that this ability, this overcoming ability is not within your, uh, you know, within your grasp, amen? And so we need to realize that. Now, we talked about several things uh, over the last few weeks in regards to this. We talked about, you know, the system of the beast, and we understood from the scriptures, from the prophetic scriptures of the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 13, we're introduced to a beast. We're introduced to a beast that rise up out of the sea, like in Revelation chapter 13, rising up out of humanity. 
And all of these beasts are a product of human governments and human uh, cunning and devisement along with fallen principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this world. Humans did not create civilization. They inherited civilization. You need to understand that. Angelic hosts, principalities, powers, and other immortal beings are, were first. In fact, the very first ones are found in Job 38. They're known as the, um, as the morning stars are the sons of God. And this happens to be an angelic race. Uh, angelic beings that were there at the beginning when the foundations of the earth were being laid. So we need to understand that, you know, we, we give ourselves a little bit too much credit, but really, basically, we are just simply following the lead of something that was already created. You see, men don't create things. They discover things. And uh, civilization and the tools of civilization are, were already created and present because we need to stop having a theological, um, basically, idea that the gospel and the Word of God is man-centric. It's not man-centric. It's not just about us. We are part of a bigger uh, cosmic battle. We're part of a bigger issue we need to be Christ-centric in our theology. Jesus must be the center of everything. And in fact, the book of Colossians clearly tells us that he is the express image of God, the, the, the exact imprint of the Father, and that everything that's created in heaven and earth, under the earth, everything that's visible and invisible was created by him and for him. And so he is the center piece. He is the true singularity, if you want to use that term. That's a modern techie term, and it's also a, you know, a kind of a, a term that a lot of the um, uh, big tech are using in their, in their quest of fusing human technology and spiritism into one um, vein. And so he is the true singularity by which all things... Um, come through and come out of. Amen? And when we make him the center, praise God, our, our theology sound. But when we make ourselves the center, then our theology is not sound. We also shared with you that in order to function and reign in the kingdom of the beast, you've got to understand that trials, tribulations, and opposition actually work to the advantage of the believer because the believer is able to use those things to develop spiritual muscles and endurance and patience. These things are invaluable to us throughout our trek in this life. And if we'll use opposition as a means of developing spiritual strength, we will come out ahead. But if we let them, you know, crush us, and uh, oppress us and cause us to go into depression and discouragement and fall into the old traps, then we're not using them to our advantage. That's the reason why James says, count it all joy when you fall into temptations, tests, and trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. Amen? And so we're, we're looking at that, and we looked at that last week. So now I want to talk to you about what revival really is, because that's kind of a, a word that's being thrown around here for quite some time, and especially when we're looking at coming out of this quarantine period, what does that look like? Well, many people have called it a great awakening, uh, uh, the revival before the coming of Christ. There's been many prophetic voices and many people speaking on this. But what I have found and where the Lord has led me over this last week as I've been praying and seeking the Lord, He began to show me that, uh, you know, the picture of revival can be found in the Word of God. So we can actually see what this is going to look like from the Word of God. There's not anything that we're going to see that hasn't first been in the Word of God. So I want to turn to Acts, the book of Acts, 
And, uh, you know, even I had not made this connection. And uh, I want to look at the establishment of the church of Ephesus as a backdrop for understanding how revival comes, what it looks like, and you may be very surprised at what it looks like because it doesn't look like anything that, that I've heard anybody say that it is, okay? Majority of times we have this preconceived notion that revival is just about everybody loving one another, everybody coming together, and it just seems like everything is perfect. At least that was my idea about it. But when we look at the scriptural and historical accounts of revival, uh, which revival is reviving of the church, but when revival goes out of the church and the church begins to do what she is called to do, it brings, first off, some, some things that we don't necessarily um, favor in our lives. <clears throat> and I want to talk to you about that because when we are talking about overcoming the world with our faith and using the overcoming faith of Jesus, we're going to face opposition like never before, and we need to be ready for it. We need to be ready for the criticism. We need to get our skin needs to be like rhinoceros skin. We're going to have to stop taking things so personal and stop getting in uh, crying and whining over being critiqued on our Facebook page. We're going to have to be bold because there's going to, you know, when, when we have moves of God, it disrupts uh, satanic uh, processes and plans. And there are people that are operating in the plans of the enemy that are going to oppose us, and we need to be ready for that. You know, it's not just going to be, oh, let me give you a tract and invite you to church. No, to truly cause the change that I believe is coming is going to require a much bolder presence, a much more influential presence. I'm not getting much hearts, but, um, you know, hopefully you'll you're get a hold of this when we get through there. But in Thessalonica, in the 17th chapter of the book of Acts, um, one of the first things that happens when Paul would come to get new territory and he'd claim new territory for the kingdom of God, we need to realize that before revival comes, there's riot. Let me say that again. Before revival comes, there's riot. You see, to come in and to declare the kingdom of God and to advance the kingdom of God means that opposing the opposing kingdom is going to feel very threatened. Now, praise God, they cannot assail against the kingdom of God. They cannot, the gates of hell will not prevail against the ruling assembly or the legislative assembly of God, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, my friends... We need to understand that uh, some of the side effects to revival aren't necessarily very comfortable nor convenient. Actually, it can bring about persecution, which we seem to be very thin-skinned on. I don't know about you, but I'm a little thin-skinned on persecution myself. At least I have the courage and the honesty to admit to it that it does bother me not to be liked. However, I'm willing to subordinate that for the greater good of the kingdom of God and the greater plan of the kingdom of God. And uh, that's what I intend to do. And that's something that we need to make decisions about. Are we wanting to be popular with the world? Or are we wanting to be approved of God? Those are the two questions that we have to ask ourselves. We have to settle that in our hearts when we go into this new era because it's going to be an uncomfortable era. It's going to be an inconvenient era. It's not going to be just all of a sudden people are going to show up and pack the church. It's going to be about advancing the kingdom of God more outside its walls than within it. And so we've got to be prepared for that. Now, every place the Apostle Paul went, he faced prison, he faced persecution, and he faced rioting, rioting. There were people who wanted to take his life. He was heavily criticized by the Judaizers and those that were trying to proselytize in the region of the Gentiles, the Jewish uh, uh, you know, Pharisees and, and, and the, uh, the, the Orthodox Jewish 
uh, religion, began to persecute him heavily and cause great disruption. They would go to magistrates and go to uh, senior officials in towns and in cities and cause all kinds of tra traps for him. And that's going to happen in this next season. You're going to see that there are going to be plots and plans that are going to try to stop the effectiveness of the church because the devil doesn't want his kingdom or his plans to be disrupted. Now, you're seeing a lot of the things exposed about this virus and, and the overall protocol uh, concerning this virus. You're seeing it begin to unravel. Why is it unraveling? It's unraveling because of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's unraveling because of prayer. There's no one whistleblower here. This is, uh, you know, this is a groupings of people that have seen right through this from the very start that God has spoken to. That shows you that the kingdom of darkness, which works in darkness, uh, gets exposed by the light. And although I don't believe we know everything that there is to this situation, I do believe we know enough to be able to walk circumspectly and in wisdom and be able to know of a surety that God is at work both to do His good will and pleasure in our lives. And so I'm grateful for His protection, and I'm grateful that no weapon that is formed against us has the ability to prosper. And uh, so I believe that He's going to continue to advance and give us a reprieve so that the harvest of the earth can come forth in the name of Jesus. Now, I'm trying to speak by the unction here and, um, and desiring and wrestling uh, with what God has put within my heart to share with you because this isn't uh, rah, 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 you know, uh, shout and dance and twirl about message. This is a very sobering message about what it takes and what is the cost of revival or the great awakening or whatever term you want to put on it. We need to prepare ourselves as an army. I hope you understand that. We need to prepare ourselves as an army, not with physical weapons. We're not to take up arms against anybody physically, but in prayer, through intercession, through the gifts of the Spirit, through the proclamation of the gospel, and through the spiritual gifts that have been put within the church, we will wage a good warfare. And so in Thessalonica, we see uh, what happens. You'd think that good news comes into a region that's been oppressed by other false gods you would think that it would have a more positive effect. But when truth comes into a situation, the positive doesn't look positive. It actually looks negative at first. Why? Because opposition and persecution come immediately after it. Jesus taught us this in, in the parable of the sower that sows the word. He says when the seed is sown on the wayside, when it just gets on the wayside soil, it says the enemy, the devil, comes immediately to get the word. So we need to understand that when the gospel goes forth in a community, that the enemy is going to be at work, working all of his different plans to try to get the word out of people or try to cause the word not to take root in people's lives. He does it first by coming immediately. And those that go a little bit deeper, he has a strategy and a plan for them through distraction, through the cares of this life, through the deceitfulness of riches, through the lust of other things. He gets our minds off on other things and extracts the word before it can develop a root system in the lives of people. And so uh, when we see negativity, we need to start reading that out of reading that through the revelation that that is positive. That if we're not seeing opposition, if we're not seeing persecution, then we're not doing what we're supposed to do. We've got to, we've got to you know, operate from a, a higher, more elevated mindset that some of the actions that the church is doing you know, as far as evangelism and reaching out and seeing people delivered and free can at first begin to be negative in the community. The community doesn't know what to do with it. Some of them are happy and blessed by it. Others are critical and even hateful towards it. We need to look for both, okay? So it says right here in the uh, 17th chapter of Acts, 
and starting with verse, well, let's start with uh, verse number 5. It says, but the Jews were jealous. This is one of the, the, the major attributes that's going to be in this new era. There's going to be a religious jealousy. As God begins to do His work, as the church begins to rise up and be who she is called to be, there's going to be jealousy. Because the Bible talks about two women in the book of Revelation. One is the virgin that gives birth to the Christ, which represents the church. And the other is the great harlot, which is the compromised spirit of Jezebel church that is controlled by the wicked one. There's going to be tremendous jealousy that's going to come about. And there's going, you know, in contending religions and other gods of the region are going to try to come against what Jesus is trying to do through the church. We need to be prepared for it. Notice it says, but the Jews were jealous and taking some wicked men of the rabble. Notice they hire mercenaries. They hire people to bring about disruption. That is happening today. That has been happening for years, is that there are plants within churches to cause division and to cause disruption. Notice he says that wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men, now notice their observation here, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. These men, talking about Paul, talking about you'd see his entourage, and talking about those that were listening to his message and receiving his message, he, they basically say their observation is that these people, through their message, are turning the world upside down. Now, just meditate on that for a moment. Begin to think about that for a moment. That these godless men would make that kind of statement. Because we know, because most of us that are watching this broadcast tonight are believers. And so we know that really the message of the gospel turns the world right side up, not upside down. What is being turned upside down is the fallen kingdoms of the principalities and powers that Jesus dethroned through his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what happens when the gospel message truly penetrates a society and a culture. The false gods are given an eviction notice. They're given their walking papers because people are coming in not invoking or trying to destroy these powers, but to declare that they are already destroyed. This is something that they have used, you know, all kinds of propaganda and all types of technique to keep from the people. And they're still doing it today. They're still saying, we're in charge. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. But we know better. We know because we just read the scripture. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome I am overcoming, and I will continue to overcome the overcoming power of Jesus. Amen? And so here they make this statement. So basically what revival is, if we, I'm just using that term loosely. Please understand, I want to use terms that everybody's using so that we can define them properly. Revival is never really about the world. Revival is about the church. Revival is always the reviving of the church body to go out and do what the church was created to do. That's revival. Awakening has to do with people realizing the need for the church outside the church walls. 
So we need to realize that we are on the verge of a great revival and a great awakening. But in order to go to this great revival and to this great awakening, we're going to have to go through some things, some things that I don't think very many of us are prepared for. I hope you're understanding this, and I hope I'm making sense to you is that when the gospel is truly brought forth and we begin to see signs and wonders and all of this stuff, it's going to be wonderful. And we will, we will see things that we have, we, have, we have birthed in our prayer closets and cried over and desired from God for years and years and years. And what a wonderful and glorious day that will be. However, we will also face persecution opposition, and we will face things that we have never faced before. Even in small rural towns like in Manford, Oklahoma, and in surrounding areas, there are, uh, there are opposing forces that will be revealed in this last day. And we need to be ready for it. That's all I'm saying. We need to be ready for it because when we come in, and begin to disrupt the status quo or the business as usual, we're turning the world upside down to them. We're turning the world upside down for them, okay? We're going to show you what that looks like here when we get to uh, the 19th and the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. But look at this. He says, these men who have turned the world upside down, this isn't just ordinary track handing out. I mean, this isn't, you know, let come to my church and listen to the good music. This is not that. This is, this is totally just as, uh, well, let's look over there. Let's look over. We looked at it. Um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> Hallelujah. 